Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite weary. This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so, why that's so. Welcome, dear listener, to Tales from Aztlantis. In this episode, we cast a critical eye on the organization known as the Movimiento Confederado de la Cultura de Anahuac, or MCRCA, and its founder, Rudolfo Nieva López. Now, if you've never heard of Nieva López or the MCRCA before today, you're probably not alone. However, if you are actively involved in Mesoamerican cultural reclamation, Nahuatl language revitalization, danza azteca, or curanderismo, odds are some aspect of what you are practicing has been directly influenced by Lopez and the MCRCA. Founded in the late 1940s by Rudolfo Nieva Lopez, the MCRCA sought to glorify Mexico's indigenous past, but relied almost exclusively on pseudo-historical misrepresentations of Mesoamerican history and culture. The MCRCA adopted the concept of Mexicayot as the defining character of their movement, and released a book in 1969 titled Mexicayot, which outlined their overall philosophy. In Spanish, the MCRCA began to refer to their version of Mexicayot as La Mexicanidad, and much like Afrocentric pseudo-scholars who shamelessly over-exaggerate African contributions to the world, the MCRCA had a strong tendency to falsify and embellish the cultural achievements of pre cuauhtemoc civilizations. For this episode, my co-host and good friend, Dr. Ruben Arellano Tlacatecat, will take us on a guided tour of Nieva Lopez's life, while I will provide a brief examination of his book, Mexicayo. So strap yourselves in and prepare yourselves for The Rise of the Mexicayo. Thank you, Curly. Rodolfo Nieva Lopez was born in Mexico City on May 13, 1905, to parents who were second-generation Chilangos. Nieva's grandparents on both sides were from Orizaba, Veracruz, and knew Nahuatl, but rarely ever spoke the language in public. The sources are unclear as to whether his grandparents were actual Nahuatlatos or native Nahuatl speakers, or if they were just exposed to the language in their community. It's likely that his family was not culturally indigenous because, as a young man in the mid-1920s, Nieva aligned himself with Criollo nationalism and subscribed to a mestizo identity. Anthropologist Lina Odena Güemes closely studied Nieva López and his neo-Mexica activities in the 1970s and published a study called Movimiento Confederado Restaurador de la Cultura de Anahuac in 1984. It was basically named after the group itself, which we'll get into in a minute. In that study, she explains that Nieva grew up, quote, in a society that suffered the most serious contradictions, at that time, the old debate about 
our origins was again taking place. Once again, the old wound would be reopened, caused by the desperation to find an identity, to be an Indio or to be a Criollo, or rather to feel Indio or feel Criollo, and therefore make every effort to live in a corresponding way." End quote. The ever-present debate over Mexican cultural identity had a deep impact throughout Nievas' life. From young adulthood to maturity, he swung from a criollo to an ind indigenous identity. As with most young people who lived through it, the tumult of the Mexican Revolution and its aftermath greatly influenced the direction that Nievas' education would take. Interested in matters of justice, he attended law school at the Facultad de Derechos at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, also known as the UNAM, between 1925 and 1930. A believer in Vasconcelos' neo-positivist cultural enterprise, Nieva was involved in the creation of various student groups, including the Partido Nacionalista Estudiantil, while enrolled at the UNAM. He was a classmate of many future leaders, such as Miguel Aleman Valdez, who would become president of Mexico, and Ernesto P. Uruchurtu, later the regent of Mexico City. Nieva maintained a lifelong friendship with Uruchurto, who kept him in the loop of Mexican politics. As a young adult, Nieva sympathized with the ideas of Vasconcelos and Criollo Mestizo nationalism, which what I describe as ideological mestizaje. Unlike many of his post-revolution generation, he was an adamant Hispanophile and held extreme anti-Anglo sentiments. He also subscribed to the immensely popular opinion among nationalist intellectuals that neither Bolshevism nor American democracy was a viable form of government in Mexico. For most of his life, Nieva associated himself with the political environment of the then all-powerful official party, the Partido de la Revolución Mexicana, which later became the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or the PRI. As a prominent member of the official party, he was also president of the Mexican Bar of Lawyers. But this would all change in the latter years of his life. By the mid-1940s, Nieva's Hispanophilia started to fade, and his political thoughts slowly moved towards indigenous nationalism, which was the realm of people who at the time self-identified as Aztecas, and Aztecas was spelled A-Z-T-E-K-A-H-S. His interest in this brand of indigenism is largely due to his interaction with an Azteca by the name of Juan Luna Cárdenas, who was the leader of the indigenous group called the Great Cultural Society of Aztec Friends. Luna and his group will be discussed in a different episode, so we'll leave him out for now. It's unclear when both men met, but it was sometime in the early 1950s, because by 1955, Nieva was already leading another indigenous group, the Olin Kalpultin Anahuac Teisca Glistli, which translates to Confederated Restoration Movement of Anahuac Culture. This is a precursor to the MCRCA. The group was and is commonly referred to by its Spanish surname and acronym, the Movimiento Confederado Restaurador de la Cultura de Anahuac, or the MCRCA. Throughout this podcast series, we will use this acronym when referring to this group. The majority of the MCRCA's membership consisted mainly of college-educated and middle-class professionals. Following Luna's adoption of a Nahuatl name, Nieva went by Senquisca Cuautli, which loosely translates to perfect or supreme eagle. The group's purpose was to restore pre cuauhtemoc culture through the philosophical doctrine of Mexicanity, or in other words, Mexicayot. According to a member interviewed by Odena Güemes, quote, the reason for the founding of our movement is autochtonism, to restore the cultural values of Anahuac, erase the series of inferiority complexes that the invasion left us. Like the Indian complex, 
begin banishing the evil that the invasion brought us, which is attributed to our autochthonous ancestors. Therefore, it is necessary to bring forth our culture, which has been in the dark, because our history was made up by the invaders. End quote. The last sentence reveals the MCRCA's agenda, which was tied to a deep sense of purpose that Aztec culture must be restored and that the official narrative of the conquest of Mexico must be revised. This distrust of the accepted scholarship was a key tenet of modern Mexicayo. Scholars have grouped the Aztecas, Nievas' group, and adherents of modern Mexicayo as quote-unquote neo-Mexicas. The neo-Mexicas perceived academic scholarship as heavily one-sided in favor of the Spanish and slanderous to the memory of their indigenous ancestors. These deeply entrenched views fed into the restorative aspect of the MCRCA, but they found ways to challenge the dominant narrative, such as calling the time before European arrival as, quote, pre Cuauhtémoc instead of pre-Cortesian, pre-Columbian, or pre-Hispanic. The adoption of Nahuatl names and the rejecting of standard history about the Spanish invasion of Mexico and the fall of the Aztec Mexica were ideas that were first in introduced by Luna Cárdenas and his Azteca group. The MCRCA borrowed and refashioned them for their own purposes, including the organizational structure which used a governing group called the Wey Tlatocan, or the Supreme Council, and was headed by the Wey Tecutli, the Great Executor, along with the Wey Siwakwawit, the Great Administrator. Nieva held the position of Great Executor from the group's inception until his death in 1968. The MCRCA lived up to its confederate name by establishing numerous calpulis, or Mexica groups, in and around Mexico City and the surrounding states. Odena Güemes noted in her study that there were 10 active groups, and of these, the Calpule de Coacalco is one of the few calpulis associated with the MCRCA that managed to survive well into the 21st century. Francisco Jimenez, an original founding member of the MCRCA and better known by his Nahuatl name, Tlaca Elel, headed Calpuli de Coacalco until his death in 2012. I have his, his book. Do you have his book, yeah. Now We Meet? Yeah, Now We Meet. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, he, um, that he's one of the, the few guys, the OGs, I guess, from the MCRCA that, uh, that kept with it and didn't, um, I guess, start a, a splinter group, you know, and, and turn against the teachings of the MCRCA. Well, that's that's a little debatable. I think one of the reasons why he started his own group is because he felt like he could do things differently and take take uh, his followers into a more spiritual realm. As you know, he ended up uh, introducing the Lakota Sundance into Mexicayo. Yeah, and, that, or, and, that, and that's something that, that Nieva would have never done in, in the MCRCA. Yeah, well, even Luna, right? Luna Cardenas's main objective was the recreating the religion right and right. this didn't really interest Nieva at all exactly so I think what what, what happened with with Lacaela is that he was trying to return back to the original vision of Luna himself of restoring um, what they perceived in their in their interpretation to be Aztec religion and you know according to Lacaela his version of restoring uh, Aztec religion was sort of reintroducing the uh, aspects of, of Aztec or Mesoamerican religion in general that were supposedly uh, taken away from Mesoamerica to protect them from the invading Spanish uh, so that they could, you know, at a later date come back and return those traditions back to Mexico. And one of them, of course, being the Lakota Sundance. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> okay, so on to a Neo Mexica revelation. By the early 50s, Nieva claimed to have received a revelation when he met various Azteca restorationist groups. He also claimed that one of these groups had revealed to him a mandate that had been supposedly proclaimed by Cuauhtémoc the night before Tenochtitlan surrendered to the Spanish. Nieva first named the mandate the, the consigna de 12 de agosto de 1521, but was later renamed the Nahuatl Amat 
or mandate to give it an air of authenticity. Apparently, the mysterious Azteca group, which was called the Calmeca de Tlahuac, had chosen him as the one to finally reveal the mandate after centuries of secrecy. This topic will be discussed in a future episode. On his way to become an Indian, Rodolfo Nieva Lopez founded the Mexicayo at Comanali, or the Mexicanity Movement, which later morphed into the Movimiento Confederado Restaurador, or Confederated Restoration Movement, which was, as previously noted, an early version of the MCRCA. During this time, Nieva became the leading figure of modern Mexicayo, and the Calmeca de Tlahuac's decision to finally reveal the mandate through him undoubtedly helped elevate his credibility among Azteca indigenists and the emergent Neo-Mexicas. And this gives rise to the spread of modern Mexicayo. Nieva was a great messenger of whatever ideology he happened to favor at any given moment in his life, and he found various ways of spreading his gospel. For instance, when he first took up the Neo-Mexica torch in the early 50s, he worked as a columnist at one of Mexico City's major newspapers, El Universal. Through his political connections, he was able to discuss the principles of Mexicayo with President Adolfo Ruiz Cortines, who served as president between 1952 and 1958, during his presidential campaign. So Nieva even wrote President Ruiz an open letter in his column asking that, in assessing the problems plaguing the nation, that he consider the plight of the raza indígena, or the indigenous people. In that same letter, he argued that although most Mexicans were of mixed ancestry, the mestizo ideology was a deficient holdover concept from the colonial era. In his estimation, it enabled the mestizos to separate themselves from indigenous people to justify their ill treatment and neglect. And he wasn't wrong with that. So. Right. So, you know, he, he did get some things right. Yeah. You know, credit is due where it is merited. As time progressed, Nieva became increasingly disillusioned by the political climate and discontented with Mexican society at large. Through the MCRCA, Nieva hoped to reverse some of the social ills that he perceived were ruining the country. The first step in accomplishing this goal manifested itself in the drafting of a Doctrina de la Mexicanidad, or Doctrine of Mexicanity. The following are a few select points that became cornerstones of the MCRCA's Mexicayo ideology. 1. Nahuatl as the national language of Mexico to the exclusion of others. That's kind of shitty. Right? <laughs> Two. I mean, Nahuatl the, is like one of 68 indigenous right. languages. <laughs> but it's the Mexica language. <laughs> And two, the purity of indigenous people contrasted against the supposed inferiority complex of mestizos. So, yeah, he's off to something there, I guess. And three, that the maximum goal of Mexicayot was the restoration of the Aztec Empire's greatness. The doctrine of Mexicanity reflected much of the original Azteca restorationist rhetoric and motivation espoused by Luna. In keeping with the objectives of the doctrine, Nieva followed in the footsteps of his mentor and created the Mexica Tlatol Cali, the Mexican Language Academy, in 1960. The purpose of the academy was to create a Nahuatl alphabet that promoted uh, the written usage of the language among Mexicans, and in true Lunaesque fashion, he ad advocated for a very particular Nahuatl alphabet that borrowed from not only Luna, but also from the Nahuatl scholar Miguel Barrios Espinosa and from the standards set forth by the Aztec Congress of 1939. The year before the establishment of the legendary academy, Nieves' Mexicanist movement changed its name once again to the Movimiento Confederado de Anahua, or the Confederated Movement of Anahua. It eventually added the Restaurador Restorationist Qualifier to signal its ultimate purpose of resurrecting the cultural, spiritual, and political values of ancient Mexico. The cure for Mexico's corruption, Nieva believed, could only come from immersing oneself in Mexicayo. The process involved rejecting mestizaje as an ideology, adopting a Nahuatl name and naming your children as well, forming calpulis, and rejecting foreign culture and ideas, particularly those of Anglo-American and Spanish-European origin. 
Always the patriot and public servant, Nieva worked a great part of his life in the government of Mexico City, where he took advantage of his relations with Ernesto P. Uruchurto, who appointed him member of the Consejo Ejecutivo de la Ciudad de México, or Executive Council of Mexico City. Having had close ties with Presidents Miguel Aleman and Emilio Portes Gil, he made them honorary members of the MCRCA in 1960. As Nieva's Mexicanismo grew more xenophobic and extremely nationalistic, his displeasure with the direction of Mexican politics increased even more. Nieva's desire to correct the ills facing the nation prompted his political motivations, a move that antagonized some of his old acquaintances. His political ambitions had a tremendous effect on the future of the organization. From 1965 onward, Nieva gradually politicized his speech and radicalized his position against the government. On September 15th of that year, he announced the creation of a new political party, the Partido de la Mexicanidad, or the Mexicanity Party, whose motto was, La Mexicanidad jamás perecerá. In other words, Mexicanism will never perish, and whose emblem was the very glyph for Nahui Olin, the Aztec spiritual and philosophical concept of four movement. The motto itself was taken from the MCRCA's official Nahuatl slogan, In Mexica Yoyelistli Aik Ish Poliwis, which basically meant the same thing. Disheartened by the lack of indigenous pride among government bureaucrats, Nieva made enemies as he steadily criticized the political system. The PRI accused him of having betrayed his ideals to the revolution. The Partido Popular Socialista, uh, the Popular Socialist Party, reproached him as being inspired by foreign doctrines. And the Partido Acción Nacional, the National Action Party, which is the more conservative of all, accused him of being a reactionary, not to mention his disdain to, uh, for the communists, uh, who were the ones that he despised the most. So he had enemies all around. The conspiracy begins. <laughs> Nieva decided it was best to tour the country under the banner of his own party, which was officially formalized on March 1st, 1967. However, his political career as a presidential candidate of the Republic was relatively short. In September of 1968, as the Mexicanity Party prepared to participate in its first elections, Nieva died suddenly under mysterious circumstances. Because of this unexpected death, many MCRCA members suspected foul play and imagined various conspiratorial scenarios. Some blamed the sacerdotes autóctonos of Tláhuac for his death because it was well known that they opposed the politicization of Mexicayo. According to MCRCA lore, these priests were highly secretive and were the main governing council of all restorationist groups. Despite the strong belief among many members that the priests existed, there is no concrete evidence to support this claim. Shocking. <laughs> Still others pointed at politicians who feared that Nieva's extremist views were gaining traction outside of his Mexico City following and wanted to stop his progress. His sister and other close collaborators believed it was the latter. Given the political climate of 1968, with the student massacre at Tlatelolco and general political repression overall, the suspicions of Maria del Carmen were well justified. Nieves' Partido de la Mexicanidad did not survive after his passing, and the MCRCA organization soon had to make other changes. The climate of Persecution in 1968 forced it to modify its name yet again until then it had been known as the Movimiento Confederado Restaurador de Anahuac and now it had to change it and add the word cultura to the name to emphasize the organization's cultural and non-political character. After restructuring the organization, Maria del Carmen, known by her Nahuatl name as Iscalotzin Cepayahuatzin, took charge after Jorge, their brother, declined to succeed Rodolfo. Iscalotzin was an elementary school teacher and school inspector in Cuajimalpa. She remained at the helm of the MCRCA only for a while. Iscalotzin dedicated most of her energy directing the MCRCA's Anahuac Culture Institute, 
where she taught Nahuatl language courses. She remained the organization's figurehead until her death in 2007. No one at the MCRCA was ever able to match Nieves' charisma and leadership, and this generated divisions and struggles within the organization. Infighting produced schisms that led directly to its loss of prominence, and new groups headed by former MCRCA members soon emerged. Without question, all of them operated under the shadow of their deceased leader, Senquisca Cuautli, the Supreme Eagle, Rodolfo Nieva Lopez. I love how um, ostentatious that name is. You know he picked that name for himself. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm no Nahuatl expert, uh, but is Senkiska, does that actually mean supreme? You know what? I honestly don't know. I will have to look into that. Mm-hmm. Mexicayotl. In 1969, a year after Rodolfo Nieva Lopez passed away, the MCRCA published his book, Mexicayotl. The book is a bizarre mixture of ultranationalism, pseudo-history, and alleged traditional knowledge meant to inspire a resurgence of Mexico's imperial Aztec past. The work is best described by Susana Rostas in her 2009 book, Carrying the Word, as follows. Mexicayot as an ideology was first expounded in a book of that name, published in 1969. Characterized by a strident nationalist and messianic message, it depends predominantly on spurious scholarship. It confounds historical time, mixing the various high cultures of Mexico, such as that of the Maya, Olmecs, and Toltecs, which were powerful at different places and times from 1500 BC to AD 1500, and makes no distinction between Aztec culture and the earlier cultures in Teotihuacan. All, it is claimed, spoke Nahuatl. The idea that the Aztecs did not commit human sacrifice is also found in this volume. Rudolfo Nieva is undoubtedly the author of Mexicayot, although the book is published in his sister's name, Maria del Carmen Nieva. But it is he who masterminded and gave cohesion to this pro-cultural movement. A lawyer who also worked as a journalist he claimed in the 1930s to be of Creole descent, for he was by birth part of Mexico City's elite. So, you know, it, it is this book that provided the ideological foundation for the movement of the same name, Mexicayot, or Mexicanidad in Spanish. And I'm not going to go point by point through the entire book and analyze just how far removed from reality most of its claims are, because this is something that I'm not quite prepared to subject our listeners to. (laughs) I will, however, offer up a few select cuts, a best of, if you will, of some of my favorite quotes. So the book starts off right away by talking about the alleged name of the American continents. The original autochthonous true name of our continent is Ishachilan, or immensity. Ishachilan is the same age as the other continents of the earth, which is why it is wrong to call it new, which that's such a goofy (laughs) point to make. (laughs) Don't call it the new world. It's just as old as all the other lands. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. (laughs) Consequently, the human beings originating from there are called Ishachilankat. According to the Ishachilankat cosmography, the original inhabitants of the continent were indigenous to it. They did not come from other continents as the Europeans want based on assumptions and hypotheses inspired by their propensity to compose the world according to their criteria. So, you know, just right off the bat, they give a completely made-up name to the American continents and then go on to claim that life here originated here. Which, which, by the way, that that name isn't even, like, he didn't come up with that name, Shachalan, anyway. Like, that's that's, Luna Cardenas is doing yeah, and we will we will get to that that man and this word in particular in a future episode. But it's just interesting that, you know, he starts right off 
by making this claim and then saying that, you know, you know, life here began here and that we didn't migrate here from anywhere else, which is totally contrary to all available scientific knowledge. <laughs> but wouldn't that make indigenous people of the Americas a different species almost if they had been born separately from the rest of humanity? Yeah, it's uh, it's not a very well thought out <laughs> uh, a claim to make. Uh, the book then goes on to what are some of my favorite claims, and that is that the Nawaz took culture to other parts of the world, in particular, Egypt. So, <laughs> so the book goes on. The Nawa, so who the, the apparently the Nawa were trying to circumnavigate the world at some point on their massive seagoing vessels, which don't exist. And in doing so, the book claims the Nawa ran into the coasts of the continents to the east of us, looking for the passage to continue its navigation. They crossed the so-called columns of Hercules or the current Straits of Gibraltar and entering the Mediterranean, they encountered the coast of Egypt, which prevented them from moving forward. The Egyptians called the Nawas Atlanteans because when they asked where they came from, the Nawas answered with the expression Atlantique, which in our language means we came through the Atlantic or the sea. Dun, so, dun, dun. <laughs> another great claim, right? So the Nawaz were circumnavigating the globe, but they couldn't because they, they got blocked by Egypt. So the book then goes on to talk about uh, Nawa Cosmovision and the concept of Teot, uh, which the book translates as creation. So there are a lot of arguments and disagreements over what the word Teot means and how it was applied to the, the Mexica Cosmovision. But in this book, Nieva Lopez defines Teot as creation. He goes on to say, Teot, finally, is the origin of the Christian God. The Atlanteans, as I have already said in the chapter History of Our Race of this book, brought our culture to the East, specifically to Egypt. He continues, in Greece, so now the Nawas are influencing the Greeks, in Greece, Theot, or creation, was attributed to divine beings in human form and with human passions as well, Consequently, the word was transformed into theos. As you can see, it simply replaced the Mexican ending of TL with the Greek ending S. So theot, because of the Greeks, became theos, which is ridiculous. And then eventually uh, becomes the Latin dios. Dios. So uh, if, if you follow the Mexicayot, a uh, train of thought here the Nawas are basically responsible for most world civilization and culture I knew high it high cultures we're number one <laughs> we're number one <laughs> the entire book is packed to the gills with statements like these completely untethered from any sort of historical reality the book is also notable for being the second published appearance of the alleged Declaration of Cuauhtémoc, a prophetic decree that was previously published in the MCRCA newsletter, Iscalot. We will be exploring this declaration in a future episode. Now, let me be clear. I truly believe that the goal of reconnecting with our indigenous roots and asserting our indigeneity is a valid one. It is a valid goal. However, the path to achieving this goal, as laid out by the MCRCA and articulated through the modern Mexicayot movement, is misguided at best. While I can certainly sympathize with the urge to elevate the historical legacy of our ancestors, a pseudo-historical reimagining of our past is not only unnecessary, it's dangerous. By promoting an idealized and often mythical version 
of Mexico's indigenous history while completely ignoring Mexico's living indigenous present, the MCRCA has engendered a worldview that ultimately erases, dismisses, and infantilizes Mexico's traditional indigenous communities. The legacy of Mesoamerican civilization, both past and present, is impressive enough without resorting to exaggeration and falsehood. And this book, my friend, is full of exaggerations and falsehoods. You know, this idea this idea of, of not only Xochitlán, but also this idea that, that the Mesoamerican peoples did not sacrifice also is something that Luna came up with. He's the first one to espouse those ideas as well. So a lot of the, like, the foundations of Mexicayo through Nieva López are borrowed from Luna Cárdenas' early work going back to the 30s and, and 40s, maybe even the, the late 20s, but I know for sure he was publishing, by the early 30s, he was already publishing his books on, on, yeah. on all this stuff. And and it's a uh, an idea that's uh, maintained today by various offshoot groups of the MCRCA. For example, Semanawak uh, Machtiloyan, which is probably the biggest of they're, these offshoot groups. I think I think they're the ones that influenced the, or at least originally influenced the, uh, a lot of the early uh, neo Mexicas, right? That started coming, out, especially people who were affiliated with danza groups, and, and and a lot of what ended up here in the U.S. comes from Semanawak uh, originally, yeah. right? And yeah, and also absolutely. also you also had. Um, um, Calpule Coacalco and Tlacael coming up in the 70s, you know, and in fact, uh, they, uh, I think we, we might get into this at some point, but Tlacael was uh, part of, uh, he was recruited as part of uh, like the Mexican indigenous branch of uh, an organization called the White Roots, White Roots of Peace, who would uh, make um, different um, uh, presentations throughout the country at different like rec centers and local communities where a large urban Indian contingent uh, and and the populations uh, resided to sort of connect people back to their indigenous roots. And so both Tlacaela's group and, and Semanawak were responsible for a lot of the stuff that we ended up, like me and you, ended up uh, affiliating and associating with Mexicayo going back in the 90s. Oh, yeah. And, and even before that, you know, just like the emergent Chicano identity, these groups had uh, a hand um, through... Um, what's Luis Valdez's group called? Uh, Del Teatro Campesino? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teatro Campesino. Yeah. Um, you had guys like Domingo Martinez Paredes right. who were talking to Luis Valdez and influencing a lot of uh, the stories that they were telling, the plays that they were they were putting on. So you had, you know, you could trace... All of this stuff back to men like Juan Luna Cardenas and the MCRCA all the way up to the present. And, and you could just kind of pick apart, you know, mm -hmm. kind of unwind that, that tied up little knot. And you could see how these people influenced Chicano identity. And a lot of the things that we were led to believe are actually traditional knowledge and ancestral teachings actually came from these guys in the 1940s and 1950s right who were like part of this extremely ultra nationalist ultra nationalist <laughs> pseudo historical pseudo scientific they would make up stuff to fit their you know bias and their agenda and their philosophy and you know you had people like Kumbat's men was who was also part of the MCRCA uh, who uh, as far as I understand is also one of the people that came up early on in the 80s and began to also influence a lot of the early Mexicayo groups uh, in Texas. I'm not sure about anywhere else, but I know that in Texas there's connections to Humbat's men, to Tlacaerlel, uh, to the, those Ansante groups that were already being influenced by uh, Samanawak. Um, so all this, by the time we get Mexicayo here in the U.S., it's already been several decades of uh, certain philosophical uh, reinterpretation of not, not only Aztec history, but Mesoamerican history and culture uh, 
and filtered through this restorationist lens of trying to bring back the greatness of, you know, Aztec cultures and Teotihuacan and the Olmec and the rest of it. But, you know, also what, what sort of left a bad taste in my mouth after I started doing the research um, into this group, uh, the MCRCA, and then, you know, found out about Luna Cárdenas and his group is that Luna Cárdenas actually studied in Germany in the 30s. And when he came back to Mexico, he this is like right at the cusp of the Nazi party, you know, rising to power and, you know, right before the, uh, you know, World War II and then subsequently the horrors of the Holocaust. He's coming back, before all that, he's coming back to Mexico and he's applying some of that Aryanist ideology to his Azteca philosophy. And in some point, in some, in some work that I've seen of his, like he's even making connections to how, you know, the Azteca were, you know, part of the, maybe not necessarily directly part of the Aryan, but that they were sort of also just as great or even greater than those Aryans. Right. So, so it always comes back to Nazis somehow. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a Nazi in the closet. <laughs> that that was that was truly devastating for me when I learned that about Mexicayo, that the, the, the original person whose foundations led to what we know as Mexicayo and had um, Nazi sympathies, to say the yeah, least. Yeah, and then on the flip side, Vasconcelos also had Nazi sympathies. Right. So on both 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 sides of this coin. Yeah, exactly. You know, even though they're they're kind of uh, in opposition to each other, right. their ideologies, they're both kind of linked to uh, an affinity for the Nazis. Well, it's it's because of that national this ultra nationalism that that I mean that's yeah. what the Nazis were. They were ultra nationalists. And when you have another ultra nationalist group, you know, they they encounter e each other and they might not see eye to eye, but they see common ground at least. You know, I, I try to take the approach um, to people who are involved, actively involved in the modern Mexicayo movement, not to be, um, you know, not to belittle them or or, uh, or or talk down to them or try to humiliate them because, you know, I, I was there too. I believed yeah. in the same stuff. I was I mean, part of that. Same here. But, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to put out information to so that they're better informed. I want them to make better informed decisions about what they're involved in. And there are better ways. You know, if you really are dedicated to, you know, cultural preservation, language revitalization, you know, there are ways to go about it that aren't so uh, patronizing and dismissive of, of indigenous people. And hopefully... You know, people come around and uh, and start seeing it for what it is. Yep. And maybe um, reform it. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be hard to to see a lot of people, especially people that, that we know personally that have, you know, invested so many years to this and, and to all of a sudden, you know, just let it go. But I think what's happening is that I think the new age influence of the 70s that really b begins to gain ground throughout the 80s um, is is more prevalent now than the ultranationalist Mexicayo that Nieva was espousing in the 60s. I agree. Yeah, I think that that ultranationalist, you know, xenophobic, xenophobic uh, stuff that was coming out of the 70s um, has been replaced by a lot of, uh, you know, new age yeah. type stuff. Right. More but about uh, touchy spirituality. spirituality spiritual. You know? yeah. I'm I'm a spirit. I'm I'm not. I don't identify as anything in particular. You know that sort of stuff. Like okay. Yeah. But you well, do know that what you're doing it has an origin, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the part you don't want to hear. Uh, there's an origin to this stuff. Whatever you want to call it now. There's an origin to it. And that's what we're here to do. We're just here to show you where this stuff comes from. It's up to you to make your own decision and choose to either, you know, continue or or not or to change it or to revive, whatever the case may be. We're, we're not here to tell you what to do. We're just here to show you uh, what we found through our research because, you know, we, we are also part of the same movement. And with that, dear listeners, we say, Dimoita, we'll see you soon on the next episode of Tales from Atlantis. And remember, folks, the truth is like medicine. It doesn't always taste good. <laughs>
but it's always good for you. Dimoitas. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, timoitase.